This is a chunk uh, in a continuation of the same you know, PowerPoint uh, presentation. So the learning objectives are the same, continuous. So I recognize that your book and other sources are going to tell you that I mean, like there are various places where deep brain stimulation, uh, you know, is, is occurs for Parkinson's disease treatment. I'm going to go with the most common region, which is actually the subthalamic nucleus. This region, uh, it's my understanding, uh, you know, is most commonly targeted because it produces the, the least negative side effects. Uh, but I mean, there are obviously other regions within the basal ganglia that you can target because it is a circuit. But, so here is one leading idea, and this is a theory that it hasn't really been confirmed, but it is, uh, you know, one leading idea of how deep brain stimulation might improve, uh, you know, deficits in Parkinson's disease and or movement disorders in Parkinson's disease. So here I sketched out a sort of a rough diagram of the basal ganglia with the primary neurochemical pathways involved. So in Parkinson's disease, you would have a loss of dopamine in the substantia nigra pars compacta, when you can see the red arrows emanating from that, projecting to the dorsal striatum, where they acted either the D1-like or D2 subfamily of dopamine receptors. These are either associated with enkephalin or substance P, and at this point split and project to either the internal or external segments of the globus pallidus. But anyway, the loss of dopamine from the substantia nigra reduces the GABAergic output from the striatum. 95% of neurons in the striatum are medium spiny GABA neurons. The reduced GABA output from the striatum renders the subthalamic nucleus neurons hyperactive. As a result, the sub and the subthalamic nucleus indirectly inhibits the thalamus. So now the thalamic output to the motor cortex is reduced, resulting in motor impairments. One idea here is that deep brain stimulation would inhibit the subthalamic nucleus and maybe even at one point lesion. Uh, this would take the brakes off the thalamus, restoring excitatory input to the primary motor cortex and treating the tremor. Huntington's disease is also caused by basal ganglia damage, but shows excessive involuntary movement. This involves progressive destruction that takes place in the caudate nucleus and the patella, or the dorsal striatum. The gene responsible, in this case, there is a single gene implicated, known as HTT, that uh, encodes the protein Huntington. We don't know, know yet what function normal Huntington's proteins have or how the abnormal version of the protein causes the symptoms of Huntington's disease, but we do know from animal models that uh, you, know, you can basically take the replication of the gene and replicate the mutation over and over and over and uh, get like, you know, actually get like sort of a scalar factor of how quickly the disease uh, you know, presents. Uh, more mutations and faster uh, early onset, it seems to be. And in fact, I mean, that's one fair criticism of the models. I think that they're sort of almost too good at this point, and they're all sort of models of early onset Huntington's disease, which is actually quite rare. Here you can see very clear neurodegeneration of the caudate and patamen on slide B uh, versus a uh, age match control there on slide A or side A. Uh, you know, again, this is uh, not the, the ventricle is getting so much bigger. It's really a result of neural loss that results in the ventricle is uh, becoming bigger and more pronounced. Some antipsychotics produce side effects due to ex the extrapyramidal system. Uh, most antipsychotics, really all antipsychotics, still have some affinity to dopamine D2 receptor, even atypicals. And, uh, you know, over time, by blocking the dopamine D2 receptor, the dopamine receptors can become overly sensitive because they're not used to having dopamine there anymore. So what can happen there is due to the super sensitivity of these dopamine D2 receptors, you can produce very jerky-like movements 
known as tardive dyskinesia that you see in patients that are being medicated by antipsychotics, particularly those that have a high affinity to the dopamine D2 receptor. The extrapyramidal system is anatomically refers to motor tracts that do not pass through the medulla, like the pyramidal motor system, which again, if you recall, passes through those pyramids of the medulla. That's what dissociates the extrapyramidal system made up of the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And on this next slide, or the next here, I'm gonna show a little video clip of a girl uh, with uh, tardive dyskinesia. And one fascinating thing here that I, I would like you to remember is that uh, this is thought to be very similar to Tourette's or the etiology or the etiology of Tourette's syndrome. Uh, Tourette's syndrome, you, you'll see similar, you know, uh, sort of fidgety uh, motor behavior amongst, you know, other tics. And it is thought that this might be related to a supersensitivity sensitivity of dopamine D2 receptors in patients with Tourette's. So an interesting parallel. It was a lot of honest. Yeah, it was a Help me understand something, Katie. He said he gave you the topic to your final essay in advance, and you turned in a blank paper. Not one word in two hours for the exam. I wrote it in my head. Put it down. In your head. Hmm. Wouldn't it make a difference anyway? They just want us to spit back exactly what they want to hear. I have an opinion, it's just not their opinion. Well, their opinion is that you should repeat the year. Just throw it away. Do you realize what this family does without so that you can go to a private school? Trucks passing 200,000 miles? Well, let's see if it'll do another 50. Our roof's about to blow away. We'll pass it again for the young people town and all so you can go to a fancy boarding school. But I'll go along because your mother wants you to go to college. And your father wants it too. Well, now we'll have to worry about leaving that. Where's the Tower, can't you see the rock? inches for the sun. No. You stop it. I get better reading arguments from the hen. Short hair makes me look like a boy. No, oh, that would be impossible. You're so beautiful. What's that thing that uh, Gus said? You're uh, uh, a flicker. A flicker? Yeah. Pretty girl. So how's your friend Stephanie? <laughs> Since when? Since Eric. Or was it Justin? Lost track. Well, you never know what'll happen. People can surprise you. This brings me to the cerebellum, the other part of the extracaramidal motor system, which recall does not pass through the pyramids of the medulla. 
And I'm much more a basal ganglia guy. So, I mean, if you really have a lot of cerebellum questions, uh, Jim Grigsby in the department is our local cerebellar ataxia expert. He could tell you a lot more about the cerebellum than I can. But so I'm just going to give you the sort of boiler plate here. Across vertebrates, the cerebellum varies in size according to range and complexity of movements. The cerebellar cortex contains Purkinje cells, which only send inhibitory messages. The cerebellum guides movement through inhibition. The cerebellum and the basal ganglia contribute differently to neuromodulation of movement. Cerebellar activity correlates with the supplementary motor area, but not with M1, or the primary metacortex in humans. By contrast, basal ganglia activity is more correlated with the primary motor cortex, or M1, than with the supplemental motor area. This is just a visual illustration of the supplemental motor area, you know, responding in phase, it would be described, with the cerebellum, whereas the basal ganglia is in phase with the primary motor cortex during a motoric task. Damage to any of the major functional divisions of the cerebellum causes specific impairments, which could indicate you know, unique functionality between the divisions of the cerebellum. The spinocerebellum receives information about body location in space and anticipates movement. Spinocerebellar damage results in abnormalities of gait and posture. Ataxia, which would be a loss of coordination, may appear in the legs following spinocerebellar damage. Long-term alcoholism also can cause ataxia and induce swaying. The cerebrocerebellum is the lateral part of the cerebellar hemispheres, and it's implicated in planning complex movements. Damage results in gestures that appear as segments rather than smooth, sort of like me when I try to play basketball. Damage here can also cause cognitive deficits. And it's also worth pointing out that cognitive deficits uh, you know, occur from alcoholism as well, and can be, uh, many of which can be, uh, are due to something known as thiamine becoming deficient. And it really has to do with a lack of appetite, a lot, lack of eating properly. You're taking most of your calories by drinking rather than eating things with thiamine in it and you give yourself an amino, amino acid deficiency, which causes neurodegeneration. Interestingly, if you just supplement alcohol with thiamine, you can stave off many of the cognitive deficits. And finally, the vestibulocerebellum receives information about body orientation. It helps to maintain posture and orientation to the external world. Damage can produce errors in gaze and difficulty tracking visual objects.